welcome to the Intuit Hit podcast. My name is Lori. Welcome. If you're a new viewer, um, you can find a group on Ravelry, Intuit Knit podcast. I can be found on Instagram uh, as Intuit Knit. And uh, if you've come to the podcast before, thanks very much for coming back. Appreciate it. Today's Wednesday, June the 28th, I think it is. And uh, so we're having a bright sunny day here north of Toronto in Ontario, Canada. And uh, yeah, I have had a hiatus, it seems. I haven't uh, recorded in a while, but you know, it's summertime here and it's just impossible sometimes to squeeze out the time for podcasting in addition to keeping up with some of the projects that I have going on. So I do appreciate you taking the time to watch. So this is a podcast about knitting, spinning, and other creative projects that I have, might have on the go. And so I'm hoping you're finding uh, that it's been interesting in the other episodes and, uh, and hopefully this will be uh, similar. So yeah, so anyways, I will get right into it. I will show you what I've been working on. I think in previous episodes, I've been lamenting about the difficulties I've been having with concentrating enough to do lace patterning. So I'm really happy that that part of my knitting history is a little bit in the past. I'm getting better headway going for some of the projects that I had started um, that contain lace patterning. So yeah, I'm really happy about that. So one of those projects was the Verdure Shawl by the uh, Fluffy Fibers podcaster, Isabel. And she's uh, made a lovely shawlette pattern for which I'm trying to do justice. And so I've got quite a bit of the lace edging. It's a crescent shawl and it's a applied lace uh, border after you knit the, the body of the shawl. So yeah, so I've got probably, well, coming up maybe about three eighths of the shawl done now. It's, it's a, um, a 10 row pattern repeat and uh, you know so I'm starting to get a little bit faster in the repeat and I think what I was struggling with before when I uh, was trying to do the lace was that I was not remembering to bring my yarn to the front or the back depending upon you know the sequence of the purls and knits and I would end up with stitches that were either too many or not not enough and yeah so it was just very confusing but I think I've got my lace no, mojo back so that's very exciting so I'm really eager to get finished with that. Uh, I will say I'm a process knitter but there comes a point when yeah I just want to finish it. <laughs> so that's where I am with, with that shawlette. So uh, similarly I've been working on some socks and I think I may have showed you uh, some bit of these socks before, but um, they also involve a lace pattern. And these are just lacy socks, lacy cable socks um, that I uh, that came from a book called 24/7. And I'm sorry if I can't remember the um, the writer's name at the moment. Uh, you'll see it in the show notes uh, on Ravelry when I get around to it. <laughs> but anyways, um, this is the sock that I've completed. And uh, it's a Norwegian yarn called uh, Sisu, Sisu yarn. And it's, it's a, a wool uh, nylon blend. And I'm hoping it will soften up in the blocking. I've done a garter stitch uh, heel flap and gusset. And uh, yeah, I've never done a garter stitch heel flap but it's very cushy and I, I kind of like that that feeling so I probably will repeat that performance on another project uh, if I can just because it's it's very comfortable to wear so this is the progress I've got made on the second sock so I've just passed that heel turn now I'm coming up to, to do the gusset so it won't be long and I'll have this as a finished finished project but uh, for the moment I've been stalled on just the straight knitting, so, but that's okay. Yeah, so that was a lace project that I had done and um, really happy that that's going well too. So it must be, you know, that sometimes in your life you just are overwhelmed with other details in your head. And I know for me, 
um, for the verdure shawl, um, I'm finding it easier to, t to follow the, the word uh, pattern rather than the, um, the charted pattern, just because, I don't know if I can explain this very well, but there's one um, element which says on the wrong side, you know, pearl, a symbol means on the wrong side, pearl, um, but on the right side, it might be knit. So I find that really difficult because when I'm knitting, I would just like to see, you know, what I'm supposed to do. Is, is it pearl? Is it knit by the symbol? Not have to think, is this the right or wrong side row? So that kind of held me up from doing it on the chart. Um, and that's just me. I, I'm very, I guess, very well, literal <laughs> as far as, you know, following a pattern and I need to know exactly what I need to be doing, not, not thinking on too many levels. So that's what uh, made me do the, um, the chart pattern. But the other thing that I found that was helpful when I'm doing, when I'm doing the pattern is to actually use this, you know, painter's tape um, to isolate for me the rows that, that I'm actually referring to when I'm doing the pattern. So what I do is I use this painter's tape and it's very sticky and it keeps being sticky for quite, quite a long time and I just keep moving it down, moving it down so I, I don't have to look at anything else. So yeah, I find that that's really helpful. I do have a magnetic board, but if I leave it and it gets shifted, well, then I'm kind of sunk. So I don't, I don't use that very much, even though I don't have that many people around, you know, going to be disturbing it. I'm always in fear of losing losing my row count of where I am. So, yeah, I find that this really works. So you might you might want to try that. So, yeah, those, those are my two lacy things. Now, for summer, um, I had been, where was I? Oh, uh, I think I went to a place near, um, well, I can't even remember the store. But anyways, uh, that's, this is just me. <laughs> I'm kind of in a confused state. Um, anyway, I bought two balls of this, um, okay, now how am I going to say this? Shakinamara? Shakinamara? It's, it's actually, it made in Italy, this, this yarn, uh, but that sounds like a French or a, a German name, doesn't it? Um, and you'll probably be yelling it on the screen here as I struggle to, to say it, but, um, it's actually made in Italy, I believe. Um, and this colorway is called Tahiti. And the actual blend is 90% cotton, 1% polyester. So it's primarily cotton. And you know, in the past, I haven't really used cotton very much. I've kind of found that it hurt my hands when I try to use it. So I had steered away from it, but this is so, so fine it's it's like a lace weight uh, yarn and it's a gradient yarn so it starts out to be this lime green color and now it's going to be changing to more of a turquoise color but what I've been doing is uh, applying beads uh, that's come something new for me as well these are 2.0 uh, size beads and I've been using a little crochet hook uh, to apply them because I've been watching some podcasts about how that how that could work. Uh, so yeah, so that's a little 2.0 bead that I'm applying with the, with the crochet hook. That's not coming up on the screen. Um, but I'm finding it, you know, it's quite enjoyable. And the texture of this is so fine that it's, it's nice for the summer. And I can imagine that when the full shawl is made, that even in the summer, it would be quite comfortable, I think, to wear. And of course, being being all cotton. So what I'm doing, it's just a pattern of I'm making on my own. I've started to increase as I go. Um, and what I'm going to be doing continually throughout is um, doing a yarn over and then catching the bead in the next stitch and then another yarn over to kind of make it isolated in the fabric. Now, this border looks very messy, uh, to my mind anyway. It's a yarn over, um, so I knit one yarn over. But, yeah, I just don't find that I'm that happy with, with the way it looks. So I think at the end, what I might do is take the turquoise color and try to do a border 
in the turquoise. Yeah, and I think that might work out nicely. So yeah, I'm just sort of intuitively going through and, and this is a size four needle, a bamboo needle I've switched to because it can be kind of slippery on the on the needle and so these bamboo needles seem to work well. So, you know, it's going to change to a turquoise and maybe back again, I don't know. I have two balls and each one of the balls is, let's see here, 50 grams, 280 meters. So, gosh, yeah, I probably will use maybe one and a half balls before I kind of get tired of the whole process and, and that will probably be fine. So 280 meters and 306 yards in one little ball. So yeah, I just thought that would be nice. So um, this is the other ball that, and so they look quite different, but they're the same dialogue. So that'll be interesting to see all the colors come out that are obviously in that one ball. So, mm -hmm. so my blues and greens are repeating themselves once again. <laughs> I, uh, I'm consistent. <laughs> So yeah, that's one of the projects I'm working on. And then I'm still working away on these socks that I had started for my daughter. Um, they really aren't too colorful for the summer, are they? But she likes the neutral colors, so I'm, I'm still working away. And this is the Regia yarn for the, for the body of the, the sock. I just did a one by one cuff and I'm working my way down I did a slip stitch heel flap and gusset and yeah now I'm working towards the toe I think I might have enough yarn to do the toe in in this um, this yarn um, I'm hoping that I will since I haven't started the second sock um, that might be uh, a bit of you know, playing the yarn chicken but we'll see how it goes yeah, so that I haven't worked on those a whole lot, and this is in the, one of the bags that I have made myself with a zipper and uh, and hand wrote. So that's one of the projects. Now, if you follow me on Instagram, you might see that some of the projects I've been working on have been a bit of diversion away from uh, knitting. Um, but uh, yeah, a, a couple of friends of, my, of mine, uh, we decided we'd get together one evening. It was really fun. We got together and had like a barbecue, but then decided we would be doing some felting. So this is a great opportunity for me to uh, explore this new medium, but also to use up some of the roving that I had bought way, way back when I had started spinning. And I don't know if this is something that you could relate to, but when I started spinning, I was so enthusiastic to to do the craft that I purchased rovings that probably weren't the best purchases um, that I'd be that happy with in, in the process. But um, some of the roving that I did purchase is quite coarse. So I know that the yarn that would would uh, you know be produced be, would be quite rough to the hand. So it was great time to use some of the, the roving that could be described as a little bit coarse. I don't even know the breed, uh, but this was the yarn that we used for the felting process. And thankfully it was already carded and processed and everything, but um, what you do in this process, and there's a couple of YouTube videos about it, is you cut out a template for the size of shoe or slipper that you want to create. And then you just keep layering the, the roving, um, sort of one layer being horizontal, one layer being vertical. And then you cover it with some netting material, nylon netting, uh, get some soap and some water and just rub the heck out of it. <laughs> um, and then you, you do that and then you flip it over, um, curl up the edges and then you, you make the same process. So you do, um, that layering of, of roving on top of that layer. And then you flip it over again, um, and then you do the same thing. Um, the, the template that you make uh, has to be out of plastic because actually it's gonna be sandwiched within these layers that you're creating uh, uh, for, the, for the actual boot. And then when you've gotten a, quite a few layers, maybe three, four, five layers on there and done this 
felting process with the agitation and soap and water, then you cut a little hole out and then you can basically open it up and start another process, which is fulling. And in, in this process, you have it trying to be getting dry by rolling it up in like a bamboo um, sheet or the ones that you might use, say, for making sushi or perhaps even a placemat that might be made out of that plastic style bamboo. And then you roll that up and you keep agitating that until it becomes even thicker than what the original layering, you know, um, created. So what I made, and I'll show you, sorry for the crinkle. So here's, here's what, here were the templates that I started with. And these are just plastic templates that you might, there's actually foam. Um, these are probably packing material that we have and make the little shoe size. That's what I used for the, for the template. And then I used the brown rolling to layer. And then I actually had mohair that uh, I had had from one of the guild meetings that I'd gone to. Somebody brought in all of this beautifully dyed uh, roving, um, mohair roving. And it's just beautiful coloring and I couldn't resist taking it. So uh, there's a lot of reds in there. There's purples, um, greens even, yellow. Um, yeah, so I have a ton of that stuff. So what I did was I made the actual boot in, in the brown. And then for my last layer, I actually tried to incorporate some of the mohair in as the final layer. And of course, this is just an experiment in, in felting. Uh, I had no idea how it was going to turn out. And in fact, you know, as you can see, the, the mohair does not adhere to, to the wool uh, in the same way that, you know, the, the actual slipper has felted together. So I, it might have actually been coaxed to do that had I done more fulling, but I just got kind of tired of the process and so I, I, I quit. But what I might do now is use one of those felting needles to actually make some of this mohair be more impregnated into, into the actual slipper. So yeah, so I have two of them and they look almost like elf slippers now because they've got all these, this wool mohair um, hanging off them. But <laughs> I think at some point it's actually not going to be that bad a, an outcome because uh, I think the, the um, needle felting might make some of those actually go into the fiber more. So that's my next process to try to um, make those be more uh, wearable, of course. The other option I have thought of too is maybe if I took some embroidery floss and just went crisscrossing over some of the, the mohair uh, pieces that I have here, that might also might make it to uh, stick more to the surface of the, of the boot as well. So yeah, just good fun really. Um, we have lots of plans that maybe we'll get together and maybe try some white, um, white wool that will be more in keeping with um, having patterns applied later uh, than this dark. But yeah, I just thought that was a little bit of a voyage into the unknown of the world of felting. So I thought you might like to see that. And uh, yeah, I consider that to be somewhat of a success. Um, so some of the other things that I've been planning to do and, um, you know, as you look through your stash, you, you can recall things that you purchased that you at the time didn't know what you might use them for. But the other day when I was going through my stash, I found some of these that I had um, purchased at a guild meeting uh, locally. And they do really inspire the imagination because they're just such beautiful colors. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. And if you've seen my feed on Instagram, you'll have seen some of these, but what these are actually are silk pods that someone has immersed into a dye bath to make all these beautiful, beautiful colors. So as a result, I've got, oops, pink, I've got gold, 
blue. And I've got like a beautiful brown color. Red even. And uh, on YouTube, you can find the process whereby you take a little wooden frame and if you soak these silk pods in a solution of washing soda, that over time what they'll do is they will slowly relax and be quite pliable and you can actually pull them apart. Now, what you're going to find in one of these little silk pods is hear that there's going to be an animal in here <laughs> um, there's going to be a silkworm that's done his duty or her duty uh, to make these uh, lovely pods and then of course um, have not survived because they've been put through a process whereby they, they don't come out of the pod um, so when you immerse this in a washing soda solution, what can happen then is that you, you're going to need to remove this little larva that's, that's in the silk pod. But after that, what you can do is actually stretch the whole pod over a little wooden frame. And from there, you can actually, once it's dry, you can actually um, uh, remove the layers and uh, create roving out of, out of the silk. So each one of these little pods, uh, I believe, will create one layer of uh, silk um, uh, hankies. And then those can be made into, into yarn. So yeah, that's what I'm gonna do one day is I'm gonna try my hand at doing some of that work um, just as an exploration of the medium of silk. And I'm gonna try and uh, see what I can do with that. It probably won't make a whole lot because, of course, you can see that there's not that many silk pods. And um, if each one of those forms a layer on the hanky, then, gosh, I think that'll be maybe at most probably about 20 or 25 layers of silk. Um, and I'm not sure how much one hanky actually contains, but uh, it'll be interesting to see if the color holds and whether each one of those layers will maintain the color that they've been dyed. But um, I just thought that that would be interesting to you. And um, this was actually from a Funky Fibers Silk. What is it? Funky Silk Fibers Collection is what it was called. It's their hand dyed silk cocoons. And it's from Treenway Silks. Um, but you can get them, uh, you can get them on um, treenwaysilks.com. And they're hand dyed in British Columbia. So um, if you have an interest in silk and you'd like to maybe do some exploration into the um, creation of those silk hankies, that might be something you could, you could get into. Um, yeah, so the other thing that I have been thinking of doing, um, I think I might have told you on a previous podcast, but I'll just go over it again because I'm quite excited about this prospect. And I've been seeing on some of the podcasts I've been watching lately about um, project bags and how some people are not so keen on zippers as the closure for knitting bags because, of course, your yarn can get snagged in, in those knitting bags. And so I think I mentioned that my mom is quite a sewer and she used to work at a quilting store uh, and that store had a demo of how you can make bags that uh, are, use another method to close them. So here's an example of one of the bags that she's actually made. And on either side, you can see that there's these little pull tabs. And then what you can do is actually open your bag by pulling it open. And if you let go, it snaps back into its original uh, position. Now, the way that this is created is using this um, measuring tape, measuring tape or metal, that what you do is you, you cut off lengths of this measuring tape metal. And then if you apply this inside the, the channel that you create in a bag, uh, whereby you've got two that will go together, so the concave, um, side of the, the metal band faces outwardly, you can create an opening that 
can just be a self-closure then if, if you align them this way. So I just thought I'd share that with you in case any of you are project bag makers and you'd like to use that idea. I got this at a dollar store and it was very, very affordable. You might like to try that. Um, I think it's a great idea. The only thing that she cautioned me about was if you start cutting off lengths of this, just be careful you don't start cutting at this end and, and, and have the rest of it slide back in because you'll never get it out. <laughs> so if you do, if you do, do use that method, make sure that you're going to be winding it all out to get the lengths that you need before you cut. Um, because once it slides back in and you've cut off this little end, it's going to be game over. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, this was another one that she'd made. It was in the purple, but the same idea, and it just closes on its own. And she put some beads, beads on it. So yeah, I thought that was kind of an interesting method to do some closures of bags. So yesterday, uh, my two friends and I, we went out to a local event, and it was uh, a yarn crawl, and. It was uh, called the Lakeside Yarn Crawl, and it involved some areas that are north of Toronto in more of a, a rural district. Uh, some of the villages that are located in this rural district are quite interesting in, in their own right, but they had yarn stores and yarn venues that we visited. So we went to a couple of them, and some of them I can't say that I'll remark on in this podcast, but I'll, I, I would like to mention a couple of them. And one of them was called The Knitting Basket. And Angie Thompson is the owner, and it's located at a part of her home. And she's located in a place near, um, well, not a place near, she's in Rosemont, Ontario. And it's, it's sort of off the, the main highway, off of um, the highway leading from Alliston to Rosemont. But um, she's actually a, a dealer for many kinds of yarns. And it's in her home, so how lovely is that, you know? And when we went in there, she has quite a good selection. And she had some indie dyers there as well, including Dragon Strings Fibers, which is a local indie dyer uh, near to me and some other beautiful yarns that, uh, that she has, which was unlike some of the yarn stores that we did visit in this um, lakeside yarn crawl. Um, so in that way, she was quite unique because you know, if you are uh, an enthusiastic knitter and you are keeping up to date with Ravelry and so on, um, it's kind of disappointing to go to stores and uh, yarn, local yarn stores that actually aren't very contemporary, you know, um, and I guess this is just a tip maybe for anyone who might be watching that is trying to improve their their businesses is that, you know, if you go to a store and you find that there isn't a variety of selection and, and most of the yarn isn't natural fiber and some of the patterns that are displayed are, you know, focusing on dull, dull um, clothes, that that probably won't appeal to some of the newer knitters that are coming up through our generations. And, uh, you know, that probably won't be helpful to your business to, to keep it going. So I was happy to see that this knitting basket um, was, was very different from some of the ones that we'd seen. And she's a genuinely lovely person. So if you go there, I'm sure that if you had a project in mind, she would be helpful in, you know, um, making that happen for you. So yeah, it was just a really nice experience to have that human touch um, to going into a yarn, a yarn place. And the other one that was quite uh, great too was also the, um, the store in Shelburne, Ontario, and it was called the Wool and Silk Company. And in that store, they had a beautiful variety of different yarns and some projects on display that would show some of the patterns that you might want, might be interested in. And in that store, I actually got a couple of magazines. Uh, one was the Knit Scene magazine. And the reason I picked up this magazine was because I'd actually seen um, a shawl that I really liked. And I'll show you the yarn that I'm thinking of making it in in a minute, but I'm not 
picture of that coming up there. Yeah, it, it's a nice design. It, it's got a, a couple of yarns that are being incorporated into it. It's almost like a herringbone design as in those yarn over uh, patterns that were created. So I quite like that and I think I will complete that shawl. There's another picture of it being worn. Yeah. So what I have in mind for that is that um, I was thinking in my stash, because I'm trying to use that stash, of course, as everybody is. Um, what I might do is make the herringbone design in this beautiful alpaca yarn that I have, which is a two-ply, but it's very, um, it's very, very soft. Um, it, it's almost like a lace weight, so I'm not sure if it'll actually turn out to be the size that is featured in the pattern, but it's 350 yards, so I think it should do justice to some sort of shawl or shawlette, and that's for the main part of the, the shawl. And then I thought maybe the border, I might even try this, so um, it, it wouldn't be, make sense to do the, the yarn over pattern in this yarn because you're not going to be able to see it anyway. So I thought the dark would be better and then the border in this yarn. And these are both alpaca alpaca yarns. This one's actually from Alpaca Acres and this is a local um, yar yarn producer in Stratford, Ontario and she actually has a farm that you can actually visit. Alpaca Acres, I'm hoping that she's still there. It's my, it was a deep stash I was going into. And then this one's called a touch of twist, and this one is that one that I did get at the Rhinebeck um, Sheep and Wool Festival. But oh, they're so soft, and I know they'll be very warm. So this one's a touch of twist, and it, it can be found at www.touchoftwist.net. And they're in Patters Pattersonville, New York. So yeah, those are two beautiful alpaca yarns that I'm hoping will do justice to that shawl. So we'll see how that goes. Um, okay, so there's that. I did pick up another magazine too, which I had seen uh, there at uh, the place in Shelburne. And this is a sweater that I thought might be really beautiful to knit. It has a unique design of using a garter stitch and stockingette stitch and kind of an attractive design. And this one has been designed by um, Courtney Spainhauer. Spainhauer? And this one is featured in the Net Scene magazine, uh, the fall 2015 version of the Net Scene magazine. So, yeah, so those were two that I thought I might try to tackle coming up. So I didn't buy much at the yarn crawl. Uh, I have so much stash I was saying, you know, but I did buy some Croy sock yarn in this Rusty Stripes um, colorway. And I bought this one from um, the Knitting Basket. So she had a nice variety of uh, patent sock wool. So but either that, this will be on my needles or I might give it to my mother. She always likes to, to have yarn and uh, making socks on the go. So that might work out. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you, um, and I had featured a part of this book on my Instagram this past week, um, at my local library, uh, I've been hounding them to see if they'll get more knitting books in. You know, it's funny about libraries, they, um, unless they have somebody on their staff that is an avid knitter and maybe knows what's happening in the, in the knitting world, um, they may not uh, sort of purchase some of the books that you'd be interested in, but I've been planting in their ears some things that seem interesting to me. So um, I was pleased to see this in the new purchases shelf and it's called Slow Stitch. Now I know this is not um, knitting related, but for any of people out there that are interested in hand sewing, uh, I really advise either to take a look at a copy or ask your library if they'd be interested. Now, if this book is probably not for everybody. But if you really do appreciate the art of um, needlework, if 
from a meditation standpoint or just have an appreciation for um, maybe even historic um, you know, um, costumes or, or knitwear or, or handmade items. I think you'll find this quite interesting. Um, and I think I may have said on other podcasts, I really do enjoy to see some of the struggle that goes into creating handmade objects. Um, because they don't have the, the slick look of um, automation, you know, that we, that we just get used to. Um, so I'll just show you a few of the photographs that maybe show what I mean. Now, what you see here is a tab, and there's some indie, not indie dyed, it would be like plant dyed, maybe um, cotton or maybe linen. Uh, but you see the stitch work that is actually surrounding that tab? That for me, it has a lovely kind of ring to it because it just kind of seems like somebody's cared about it and has taken the time to actually, you know, do their little thing there with applying all these lovely stitches, these hand stitches that aren't uniform necessarily, but do create a visual, you know, uh, design element that can't be actually recreated by uh, mass production. So um, that's just one, but what they do reflect on is um, a way of um, creating um, texture on fabric that is called a cantha style of working fabric. Um, and they're usually described as techniques that are quite rhythmic and absorbing. Um, so what it is, it's a, like a running stitch pattern that goes through and creates a direction um, which can be changed based on how you direct those running stitches on other areas in, in the piece that you're working. And it usually is through a couple of fibers or a couple of layers of, of material at a time. Um, I'm probably not doing justice to this whole topic, but some of the Japanese kimonos and happy jackets that you can find that are Japanese made, um, will feature this element of working stitches that incorporates maybe many different fabrics, um, but also maybe ties these fabrics together in the running stitches that are crossing the borders of the piecing. Um, I did look up online because there was, I should have marked it out here, I'm not a very good podcaster, am I? But there's a, a certain word that I'm not, I just haven't, named here as we're speaking um, that describes the uh, the stitch work and it almost looks like mending maybe that's why I like it because the whole act of mending is very meditative and soothing isn't it if you're repairing something and bringing it back to life um, but if you maybe search out uh, cantha k-a-n-t-h-a you might actually find a whole other world of uh, stitch work activity that you haven't thought of before and this is something else too that I it was just so I don't know it just made me think uh, look at look at this um, handmade sweater that somebody has so lovingly actually mended to be repaired but also repaired with a yarn that is not related to the rest of the piece I don't know it just struck me as how to describe how this affects me, but um, it was a moth-eaten sweater, and the person that's done this, her name is Celia Pym, P-Y-M. She's featured in this book. Um, and she repaired this sweater to be restored, really, but basically in another yarn. And I know it probably looks like a museum piece, but there's just something about it that really appeals to me. I guess it speaks to the value of what what we do and the fact that somebody would take the time to restore it to its original structure um, and you know not not necessarily the pattern that the creator had had in mind when she did it but yeah there's just something very restorative about it so um, yeah check that out if, if you have any interest in it um, and of course you know it does tell you too that handwork 
however you do it, has its own quality that can't be can't be duplicated anywhere else. And um, you know, I just think that's a really lovely thought. I did want to share something I'm doing, uh, making progress, slow progress, as they say. But I'm I've completed some spinning here, so uh, this will actually be on the sweater that I've repetitively shown you uh, that I'm working on my own hand spun sweater and this will probably go into the yoke area because I'm working up on the sleeves and this is just merino and a combination of alpaca actually that I put into this particular skein um, so it's all washed and dried and so on so I will you know get busy now working on the rest of that sweater See if I can get it done. I would like to show it to you sometimes so you don't think that I'm, I'm you know, giving you the gears when I say I'm going to finish this hand spun sweater. But <laughs> yeah, it worked out pretty well. You see the difference in these two? This one's more of a grass green. And when I spun it up, I thought, oh, that's going to be shockingly different than the rest of it. So what I might do is incorporate maybe rows of this and then using rows of that to kind of make it tie together but yeah that's the problem when you when you spin some skeins start a sweater and don't necessarily know how many skeins it's going to take because it's your own design <laughs> you have to sort of fudge it at the end and that's that's what I'm doing a queen of fudge it's probably the name of this podcast <laughs> um yeah so I think we're at a good time uh to end it here I uh, I hope that you've enjoyed it it's been um a longer podcast than I usually have. Um, yeah, so if you wanted to join our group on Ravelry, it's called the Intuit Knit Podcast Group. I have to say I'm not very active, especially this time of year in the, on the podcast, but um, I'd certainly love to reply to any comments that you might like to make if, if you join our group. Um, usually I feature some of the paintings that I've done uh, on this podcast, but we're not going to give attention to it right now because it's way beyond the time that I usually spend and it's going to take me all day to upload this. So um, that is one of my older pieces. It's kind of a timely thing because it is summer and all those geraniums are out in full bloom, aren't they? So, well, I hope that you enjoy all your crafting that you're doing and I hope that your summer's going well. Please come back and see me again if this has been something that you've enjoyed and I hope that you have a great month ahead. Okay, bye for now.